So phase one of the Law and Neuroscience Project was a, uh, a large group of terrific researchers, both in law and neuroscience and philosophy, who came together to start exploring the boundaries of this new field and how one might use the techniques of neuroscience in ways that could further the goals of law, particularly in this context of the criminal justice system, although there are important civil applications as well. And out of that exploration came a wide variety of studies that laid really important foundation for some of the things that we're hoping to do in the next phase of this research. We learned things about how um, people make decisions. We learned more about different populations, addicts and juveniles. We learned more about the fundaments of capacity for self-control and uh, issues having to do with um, criminal responsibility and bioprediction and these sorts of things. So we traveled a lot of territory and phase two is an effort to uh, focus on several areas that we think are particularly ripe for investigation. And talk to me about those. So we're going to be focusing our efforts on three main areas, uh, two of them empirical and one more conceptual. The first two empirical directions are mental states in which we're going to be trying to learn about the ways in which neuroscience might help us understand the probability that people in a certain situation will have been behaving with one mental state compared to another. So during a bad act, if you're an addict, are you more likely to have been behaving recklessly or negligently? Um, we're also under the category of uh, mental states going to be trying to press further on the experimental techniques that have attempted to isolate lies through neuroscientific techniques. We're early in that research and indeed we think there are a lot of reasons to believe that that research is and that technique is fundamentally limited, but we want to better define the boundaries of when that might theoretically be useful and when it might not. We're also under that uh, research stream considering uh, the ways in which these techniques, which involve computer learning algorithms and pattern classification, might enable us to better know when a brain is recognizing something that is already in autobiographical memory, that is, to identify a neural signature of someone recognizing something. And so that's more how or less. Is that, how can that be used in practical application? Well, you could imagine that if you confronted a suspect with 25 images of possible locations of a crime and then 30 images of possible weapons that could be used as a, at a crime, you could imagine, we're not there yet, but you could imagine that it might be relevant evidence to know that in one of these pictures, that happened to be the one that was relevant to the crime, the individual has a very different neural signature than they might otherwise. There are a lot of challenges with respect to interpreting what you might do with that information, but it's a sort of technique that we're exploring to see whether it might be useful to the legal system. The second empirical project is going to be focusing on capacity, and capacity in two related contexts. One is going to be the capacity for self-regulation, essentially the ability to control yourself. We anticipate that we might find that there are variations among the population in their ability to control themselves in certain contexts. This could theoretically be legally relevant. The other context is related to the ability of adolescents to control themselves. Even normal adolescents are more impulsive than normal adults. So we want to use these techniques to explore not only the development of the adolescent brain and its behavioral capacities over time, but also learn something specific about the capacity of, uh, of adolescents to control themselves. So the interesting thing with that is that you may be able to say, you know, could they control themselves or not, but that may not affect whether they're punished or the legal side of it. Absolutely. So what the law chooses to do with this information is always a completely separate question. We may provide information that's useful to the law in thinking about the trade-offs that it must make, but ultimately in a democratically percolating society, the value systems that you bring to bear on whether you want to treat adolescents and adults differently or whether you want to treat addicts and uh, 
unaddicted individuals differently. Those are policy questions, not science questions. What we're trying to do is inform the decisions at this intersection. So our third area of research is going to be focusing on issues of evidence on the conceptual side. And those issues basically are going to be broken into two. On the one hand, we're trying to help the legal system divide uh, evidence that should be admitted from proffered evidence that should be excluded. On the other hand, the other uh, stream in the evidentiary prong of our research network is going to be devoted to trying to provide the legal system with some really concrete information and guidance about how to solve or at least address a really particular problem. And that is the fact that scientists with neuroscientific techniques are generally providing information about groups of individuals. They study 25 people and they say the average brain did this. On the other hand, the legal system is usually confronted with a single individual who has been accused of doing a single thing and they want to learn about that person's brain. And so the question is, how do you draw inferences from group-based data that might be relevant to the resolution of an individual case?